Good day to you, and it's the start of another week here in intercultural communication, and so we find ourselves in the hallway of the building that I work in. Some of you are taking this class from afar, and you're not even going to ESU except for this class, so you won't have seen this office, but I thought it'd be maybe of interest to show you the workplace setting that I work with students in, and also show you some things about my office. So over here, I have my diplomas on the wall. Yeah, Penn State. Millersville, that's where my degrees are from. Over here, have my, my uh, Rolling Stones tongue that my daughter made for me in shop class in high school. And my son made for me uh, the, the Rolling Stones poster at the bottom. Over here, I have my window that I get to look out of. I worked at ESU for, geez, it was about 20 years before I got an office with a window. So this is a real treat. Here I have a bookshelf. Got my favorite books on there, some photos as well. Up top here I have the classics, the classics from ancient Greece. Got the Loeb series as they're called, some famous Greek orators. And then over here, this is my desk that I work with each and every day. And opposite the desk, I have a place for students to sit. Students to sit and to look at a computer screen so that when we do advising, they don't have to look over my shoulder and they can see everything that I'm seeing. Yeah, it may not be the best framing for that camera. Excuse me while I close my door. But it's one way of introducing today's class, which is all about nonverbal communication. Because we're constantly communicating things to people through, through symbols and signs and really anything other than words. And nonverbal communication is particularly important in intercultural communication, even though the book doesn't highlight this surprisingly, because when we don't speak the language of another culture, and I'm not just talking about a foreign culture, I'm even talking about, for example, slang that's used by young people versus a person of my age. There's a whole language there that we don't understand, a whole verbal language, and so we rely on nonverbal communication to understand meaning. And so nonverbal communication is absolutely essential to intercultural communication. That's what we're going to be talking about. But first, let's just make some points about how to continue to do well in this class, since it is the beginning of a brand new work week, a brand new week for you to reset things if you haven't done as well as you would like to. Remember, you get to drop four discussion post grades and four quiz grades. So really, all of last week can be erased if you didn't do that well. And you can start from afresh today. Here's the things you need to be doing. Number one, in your discussion post, you need to make sure that you're adhering to the word count, 190 to 210 words, no more, no less. And secondly, no attachments. No attachments in your discussion post. Just put your answers right in this, the D2L box. If you're a student in this class, and every day last week I'm going to grade your discussion posts, and I'm putting feedback saying, no attachments, no attachments, please, and you're still sending me attachments, what your nonverbal is saying to me is, you're not reading my feedback. It's good students read feedback from professors, and out of a courtesy, if a professor takes time to give you feedback on your work, you're going to want to read it, I would hope, because it's saying, I appreciate what it is that you're saying, and I want to do better. If you blow it off, it's saying you're just trying to get through the course. All right, and then finally, when you are making your discussion posts, make sure that you're demonstrating that you're not only reading the chapter, but that you are understanding it and applying the concepts to what you're writing. It doesn't help your case in a discussion post if you just put one sentence and cite the author. You have to show that you're really reading that material and you're going to use the concepts that are talk talked about in that chapter to explain some of your observations. So don't just put a sentence and then go on as if that sentence doesn't have an importance anymore in the post. Make sure that you're taking words out of that sentence from the chapter and saying, here's how that is going on in my observations. Those are the keys to doing well as we go forward. It's really not a difficult course, this online course, if you follow those few basic rules. Okay, so let's dig into nonverbal communication today. You know Darwin, Charles Darwin, the great evolutionist, the biologist that went to the Galapagos Islands and studied birds and turtles on those small islands to try and formulate theories about evolution. He said that nonverbal communication is genetic. We're born with it. And especially with our faces. Like, we are born with the way that we smile. That's what he said. We are born with the way that we express fear or happiness 
or anything else on our face because he said it was a way of understanding whether a person was a stranger or not. If a person is a stranger because they don't have the same, the same uh, facial expressions for happiness or fear that we have, then they are a person to be um, guarded against because they may attack you. Well, that's in, that's in the animal kingdom. But I think that nonverbal communication is more learned than it is genetic, and it's more learned based on the culture that you grow up in. For example, I'm going to take a photo of you, okay? All right, ready? On three. One, two, three. Cheese. What are you doing now? You're smiling, right? Why are you smiling? If you look at people in other countries, particularly Germanic countries, they don't smile automatically just because a photo is being taken. I mean, we smile for photos even if we're not happy. Even if we don't think that the photo is a great idea, we smile because we want to present ourselves as smiling, but also because we've been taught by virtue of growing up in the United States that smiling is what you do in a photo. So you can decide for yourself about Charles Darwin. Truth be told, it's probably a mix between we're born with certain ways of expressing ourselves and we learn certain ways of expressing our nonverbal communication. Now let's talk about nonverbal communication, which again is any communication other than verbal communication. It's nonverbal communication. And let's talk about nonverbal communication functions. These are functions that nonverbal communication do for us in average everyday conversation, especially in intercultural settings. So one function is that nonverbal communication replaces spoken messages. They replace spoken messages. Sometimes you just can't speak. Like when you're in class and the professor is going on too long, past the time that the class is supposed to end, and you look over at somebody, you're like, is this really happening? You, you look over and your look says, does the professor know what time it is? You can't say that out loud in the class, so that your nonverbal communication is replacing a message. In most countries across the world, when you come to a traffic light, red means stop, green means go, and yellow, it depends on the country, has different meanings, but in general it means caution. Sometimes you come to countries, it's a blinking yellow, which means you have to stop first and then you have to go. In our country, a blinking red means you can stop first and then you get to go on your own. But in general, those nonverbal communications exist across all countries. By the way, not all symbols, symbols of nonverbal communication have universal meaning. If you look at the Confederate flag, for example, that's a really racist symbol for a lot of people, especially if you're of African-American descent. It represents the South and all the oppression of slavery. But for Southern white people, not all white people, but ma many of them, the Confederate flag is a representation of the history of the South. And it marks a time period where the South was different from the North and had different values. And so the Confederate flag as a symbol does not necessarily mean the same thing for both groups of people. It's not universal. The next function of nonverbal communication is to send uncomfortable messages, messages that are harder to send in person. Like you've got a roommate who never does the dishes, and you know that if you were to sit down and talk to that roommate, it would be uncomfortable, be the first time you're expressing discontent, or it would be bringing up a subject that you've had lots of problems with before and you're getting nowhere. So instead what you do is you do all of your dishes and then you leave their dishes. You leave their dishes to send the message, you clean up your dishes. It may not happen, but that's what you're doing. It's, it's a way of getting something across that would otherwise be uncomfortable. Or when somebody passes away and on Facebook you send them just a sad emoji, a sad face emoji, instead of saying to them in person, I'm really sorry for your loss, which could be uncomfortable. It's a way of sending a symbol in place of, in place of, but more importantly to send to make it easier to send an uncomfortable message. And like when you're talking to somebody, you're talking to somebody and you don't want to talk to them anymore, you don't have time, you don't find them interesting, you have something on your mind, instead of saying, I don't want to talk to you anymore, and walk away, you just start to turn your body to the side, and yeah, I know what you mean, and you leave, your nonverbals send an un what would otherwise be an uncomfortable message. Another function is nonverbal communication also forms impressions that guide communication. Forms impressions, first impressions often. Like when you dress up really nice when you're going for a job interview. Or when you dress up in some of your best clothes with what you can see are considered to be your best colors and do your hair really nice because you have a date. Or when you shake a person's hand and you make it firm. Or when you're on time for class to send the professor a message that I'm a serious student. These are ways of forming impressions through nonverbal communication that then guide the communication afterwards because you hope there's going to be 
positive response to what you're choosing to send non-verbally. Yet another non-verbal communication function is to make relationships clear, the relationship between two people. Like when the chairperson of a committee or the coach of a team sits down and puts themselves at the end of a table or puts themselves in the center of the group or stands up while everybody else is sitting down. You're not just making it easier to communicate in that setting to the people that you need to communicate to. You're also sending a message about your relationship. Like when you go to hug somebody and you're really interested in, in having a, an intimate relationship with them. You'd like to date them. You, you, it's your first chance to have physical contact with them. But, but they kind of keep a distance between you and tap you in the back. Or their hug is shorter than yours is. Um, they're def trying to define the relationship and you're trying to define the relationship or see where the relationship could go. Um, also, another example is, is when you take a child's hand as you cross the street and you hold it firmly and you yank them along because you're saying, I am in charge of your health. I'm going to make sure, even though I may be a little physical here right now, that you're not going to get hit by a car. So nonverbal communication has a function of making relationships clear. <laughs> A next function of nonverbal communication is regulating interaction. Regulating interaction, you know, when you have a conversation with somebody, a lot of times you have to fight to get a word in. Or other times it's really tough to get a person to respond. It's almost like work to have a conversation with them because they don't ask questions or they don't volunteer information. They're very, very quiet. So nonverbal communication helps us do those things like, yeah, tell me more. Yeah, keep going. Tell me more about this this funny story that happened to you. Or, hold on, I want to say something. Hold on a second. Just wait a second. Wait a second. Stop. Stop. Okay, regulating interaction, we do that through nonverbal communication. And finally, reinforcing a message is a function of nonverbal communication. If you've ever really been angry at somebody and you leave them and you say, I'm out of here, and you walk out the door and you slam the door, the door slam is meant to reinforce, to highlight, to confirm how upset you really are. Or when you say, you know, I was this close to buying that car, you're showing how close physically with your fingers you were to buying that car. Or when you scratch your head, I don't understand. What? What? I don't understand this math. This I don't understand this this chapter in math. It's it's too much for me. So that wraps up the functions of nonverbal communication. Now let's go into types of nonverbal communication. I hope you find this material as interesting as I do because especially when you look at these types across cultures, you see a lot of differences. So the first type of nonverbal communication is proxemics. This is the use of space. And you know, a lot of cultures travel on public transportation, so they're used to being next to each other. In the US, we have bigger spaces. We have big spaces between our houses. We have really wide roads. We have lots of room in our classrooms. So when we sit on a bus and a person comes in and sits down next to us, it can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. We kind of feel like our space is invaded. And yet in England, where you often are taking the train, you're often taking a bus, sitting next to somebody is part of your average everyday routine. So to sit next to somebody and to bump shoulders with them and your face is, you know, it's not an uncomfortable feeling. And actually Ed Hall did a study of space where he actually quantified the spatial relationships in the United States. And he found that there are four different areas of space. The first one being the intimate area. This is where we let people in that we have an intimate relationship, not just necessarily a sexual relationship, although that is one type of intimacy, but a person that we feel really comfortable sharing things with that we wouldn't share with other people, a family member or a deep friend. Those people are, are within um, zero or touching space to 18 inches of space. So that's just, you know, that far. We feel okay when people are that close to us, if we have an intimate relationship with them. If we don't, it makes us uncomfortable. Then comes personal space. Personal space is 18 inches to four feet. This is a space that we consider that we have some ownership over. It's a space that belongs to you. And we let people in that we're friendly with, but we also can decide not to let people in we're feeling uncomfortable with, even though we may have been friendly with them previously. If somebody acts in a way that makes is inappropriate, maybe they make a joke that you don't care for, you, you step back until they're just outside of that four feet. You're, you're sort of ostracizing them outside of that, that um, personal space. And then there is casual space. Casual space is four feet to 12 feet. So that's like 
on the other side of that room over there, that's about 12 feet. Now, I probably can't pick it up in the video here, but that's about 12 feet. And that's our space that we, you know, we're open to a person being into our space where we feel somewhat comfortable and with them and familiar with them. And so we allow them to be within 4 to 12 feet. And then there is the public space. The public space are with unknown people, don't know who they are. It's, it's more than 12 feet. <clears throat> so if a car pulls up, it's at night, has tinted windows, has some loud music, has some people in it that you can't see because of the windows, more than 12 feet is probably where you're going to keep that car so that you have the chance for safety, in this case to run away. It's a public space. So that's the first type of nonverbal communication, proxemics. Now let's go into the second type, which is kinesics. Kinesics is a whole range of things that have to do with the gestures, body movements, and facial expressions. It's like using your body, um, as I'm doing here right now. Um, and it can be intentional or unintentional. Like you're sitting talking to somebody, and you yawn, and they say, they're bored with me. And when actually you're really tired, or there's a lack of oxygen, or you have something that's going on inside of you and, and the yawn helps you buy some time to think about what you're going to say next. So kinesics is the way that we use our whole body. It's our head, it's our arms, it's, it's our facial expressions, it's how fast we walk, it's how our posture when we stand. Um, we find that that's very, very different in, across cultures. Um, in China, for example, and Japan and other Asian cultures, there's a lot of bowing that goes on, more in Japan and other countries. And that's actually lowering yourself. We saw that this weekend. In fact, uh, Donald Trump went to the Middle East and he bowed before the king of Saudi Arabia. It's a kinesic. It's, um, expressing, uh, it's expressing communication through your body language. And it can be very different. For example, in the U.S., the thumbs up is good. But in Greece, it means go get effed. Yeah, F-U-C-K-E-D. Um, and then there's the forefinger to the thumb. That's in the U.S., everything's okay. How'd you make it? I made it okay. But in France, that means zero. So we have lots of differences when it comes to kinesics. Speaking of differences, the next type of nonverbal communication is, is chronemics. Chronemics refers to the sense of time. And I, I differ with the book a little bit here. The, the book makes a distinction between Western and Eastern cultures. I think it's more related to how close you are to the equator. You know, when you're on the equator, it's the center of the earth, the sun is always in the same point in the sky. It's always going around. When you're in the north, like where we are, the sun is in the sky less of the time during the winter months and more of the time during the summer months. Same if you go down way down south to Chile or to Argentina, um, same thing. In the winter, the sun is in the, the sky the most of the time, and in the winter, it's in the sky... Uh, uh, sorry, the, in the summer, the, the sun is in the sky the least amount of time, in the winter, the most amount of time. So what does this all have to do with time? It has to do with viewing time in either a linear sense, which is to say that once something happens, it never comes around again, or in a cyclical sense, which is like time is on a giant wheel. So in the United States, the book uses the example of Christ and, and the belief that Christ's birth and death are linear, that they, they don't recur, that they've happened once and... The next thing is going to happen down the line. Um, similarly, in the U.S., if, if somebody says, okay, let's go out on a date Friday night. I'm really excited. Can't wait to see this person. And then they, they cancel on you. It's like, okay, well, that can never happen again. Um, that Friday is gone. It was a great time for Friday. Um, I didn't have to work. Um, I really wanted to go out with this person. Okay, it was canceled. It, that time is done. That's very, very different from a Mexico, which is much closer to the equator. In Mexico, time is cyclical. They have a saying in, in Mexico, mañana, mañana, that's when things are going to happen, which, which literally means tomorrow, but really could mean any time. Because you know what? 3 o'clock today is the same as 3 o'clock tomorrow, as is the same as 3 o'clock the next day. It's just a wheel that comes around, just like a clock, a face clock. The minute hand will come back to three. If it's not three o'clock today, it'll come back to three again. You're going to get your three o'clock tomorrow. And that's because you're getting closer to the equator where the, where the sun is constant. It's always going to be the same amount of light the very next day. So chronemics are very, very different across different countries. Next up as a type of nonverbal communication is paralanguage. Paralanguage are the, the nonverbal elements that are associated with our voice. 
So when you're speaking, you're saying words, but you're also speaking at a certain pace. I tend to speak rapidly in these videos because I know that you can start and stop them and because I don't want them to be too long. Um, also, it has to do with the tone. Um, Swedish people, when they talk, if you've ever seen the, the old um, Muppets video um, with the Swedish chef, it's making fun of the way that Swedes seem to be singing while they're speaking. It's an element of paralanguage. Americans are said to have a very assertive tone. They speak with a kind of punctuation and emphasis. Not all Americans speak like that, but there's a directness that comes with the paralanguage of Americans. Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans often speak with a, a very gentle voice. It's a different kind of Spanish than other kinds of Spanish that you hear in other Latin American countries. Puerto Ricans are very soft-spoken in general. Now let's move on to the next type of nonverbal communication, it's silence. You can have silence before a word, and then the silence creates the anticipation of what you're going to say, just like what you have on so many TV shows. You know, I was watching House Hunters last night, and they chose, and then it goes to a commercial. You have silence, and you come back, and you have to wait to see which property they chose. Um, in, silent, in China, silence indicates respect. Uh, if you're a person who is in the presence of an elder, person who's wiser, who's lived longer than you, a family figure, um, you spend more time listening and less time talking. Silence is said to, be, said to be one way that you indicate respect. Here in the U.S., silence often indicates you're upset at somebody, as in giving them the silent treatment. When you're around them, you don't say much. Um, what you're really saying, though, is I'm so upset with you by virtue of your silence. Next up is a type of nonverbal non communication is haptics. Haptics is the use of touch. And the way that we touch each other really varies across different cultures. If you look at the Mediterranean countries, those countries that are around the Mediterranean, your Spain, your Italy, your France, your Monaco, you know, the tiny country within France, and then on the other side too, your Morocco, um, those countries that circle the Mediterranean, touch is very common. So uh, if you speak to an Italian person here in the United States who comes originally from a Mediterranean country, um, they're often touching your arm, this part of your arm. They're often, you know, to emphasize something, you know what happened, and they grab your arm. You do that in Britain or, or Germanic countries, that's seen as kind of a strange thing. Um, touch is very different between Mediterranean peoples and Northern peoples, Germanic peoples. Uh, similarly in Thailand, you know, if you see a person with a bald head, if you have a bald head in the U.S., if you're a male, you're going to have people touching your head all the time. They want to feel it. It's unusual to you. Um, or even a crew cut. You know, I want to feel that. It's, it's seen as okay. It's like, let me, let me see what that feels like. And I'm also expressing, you know, that it's kind of fun. Um, you try that in Thailand. In Thailand, that's rude because the child's head, if you do it to a child, is the home of their soul. And to touch their soul is infringing upon their personal space. Um, in the U.S., we sort of fall in between. We touch each other. Especially in sports, sports is that one area where you have absolute permission to touch a person on the team. I mean, where else can you get away with slapping a male on the butt than you can in baseball when they cross home plate? Um, try doing that in a class if your friend gets a, an A on a test. Hey, buddy! I don't think that that's going to fly, right? So in the sports world in particular in America, we have a lot of touching that goes on. Next up, as a type of nonverbal communication, is territoriality. Territoriality. It's how we mark our space. You know, we claim space all the time. If you have a roommate, you know what I'm talking about. You put your stuff all over your wall. Um, you will take your dresser and you'll use it as a kind of a dividing line. Um, you'll have your place for where you keep your car keys. Um, these are ways that we mark our space. Territoriality is just all about that. And the book talks about a particular concept that a lot of Americans use actually from China to arrange their, their living room furniture and any furniture in their house, and it's called feng shui. Feng shui. It's F-E-N-G-S-H-U-I. It's paying attention to arranging things in our household so that they are in harmony with nature. Like you would never put a bookcase so that it's leaning across part of a window because that's blocking nature. And just really think about the whole idea of the way that we arrange our family rooms. We put our TV in there first, and then we arrange our family room around. It's saying that the most important focal point of that is actually the TV. It's not 
the outdoors. It's not having a seamless a seamlessness between the indoors and the outdoors where you feel like when you come inside, you're not boxed in. Now, there, there was a very famous architect in the United States named Frank Lloyd Wright. He designed houses that were very nature-based. I went to see one of those in Pittsburgh this summer. It's called the, the uh, Falling Waters House. And it's built over a river, over a river. The river runs underneath the house. And one of the things that he did was he built corners that were made out of windows. And you could open these windows up like this. Not like this, but like this. He called that breaking the box. The idea that when you're in the house, you need reasons to try and pull you out of the house, get you outside. And probably no time is that more important than today when we're on the computer or on the cell phone all the time. We need to... We need to remember that there are trees outside and birds and there are clouds and there's rain and there's sun and there's green grass that's coming about and flowers. And so Frank Lloyd's right idea was to break that box with that window that opens up like that. Very fascinating to me. And finally, that brings us to our final type of nonverbal communication, which is olfactics. Olfactics. O-L-F-A-C-T-I-C-S. That has to do with sense of smell. We're still trying to learn about that because that's a tough one. And we know, for example, that the Romans were just absolutely obsessed with roses. They had them indoors. They had them outdoors. They put rose petals on their clothing. They thought that the smell of the rose led to some kind of fulfillment in life that would not be satisfied by somewhere else. Um, here today in the United States, uh, some people, perhaps your mother, most often is a mother, is using aroma therapy in their house. They're putting smells in the house to try and create a sense of calm in the house. Uh, we do that in our cars with the, the, the um, I forget what they're called, but you know, the things that hang from the rearview mirror to put off a perfumey type smell. And in fact, advertisers in the U.S. have almost defined hygiene by smell. It's as if they have said that only if you smell um, a, a deodorant on a person or perfume or toothpaste or shampoo that they are clean. And yet, that's not necessarily the case. You can go stand out in a rainstorm, and you can get clean, and you won't have a smell to you that comes along with putting perfume on or putting deodorant. So advertisers have really played on the fact of olfactics. And just finally, on that subject, I had a really interesting subject that olfactics are defined for us in a lot of ways by our culture. There was a researcher that I heard on the BBC World Service. That's the British Broadcasting Corporation's World Service. It airs on WESS Radio, our radio station here at ESU. And this researcher did an experiment where they told the audience um, what they were about to smell and then watched their reactions. So the first thing that they did was they gave the audience Parmesan cheese. They said, this is Parmesan cheese. Smell it. What do you think? And the audience, oh, this is fantastic. These are the ingredients that's in Parmesan. That's what's giving off that smell. Mm, okay, especially if you like Parmesan cheese. Really, really, that's a nice smell. And then he said, okay, now I hate to do this, but I have to get across how extreme our smells could be. Now I want you to smell vomit. And the audience is like, oh. And he produced the smell. And he wrote, oh, I can't stand that. I, uh. Guess what that smell was? It was Parmesan cheese. So people could not distinguish between the two because they were foretold beforehand what the smell was going to be. Very interesting, I thought. So that wraps up nonverbal communication. I hope that you have a great day.